In this episode of the Hockey Nuts Podcast, I tell Steve how I met two NHL referees last weekend. We also get you caught up with all the news from the past week. Plus, we talk about preseason prospect tournaments, and we get you caught up on the last-minute World Cup roster changes before they get going for real next week. So stay tuned for another action-packed episode coming up next. Shut up and sit down. Hello and welcome to the fourth episode of the Hockey Nuts podcast. My name is Wayne, and I'm here with Steve. How you doing, Steve? Uh, good, Wayne. Uh, Wayne, how you doing tonight? Good. Um, we're uh, here again in the uh, end of summer, dead August time of the year, um, but things are about to get going in the hockey world, and uh, we've got a lot of stuff to talk about tonight, so uh, we'll go ahead and uh, get right into it. Uh, the first thing I wanted to bring up, though, before we start talking about the NHL and whatnot, uh, I wanted to talk about something that happened uh, over the past, well, it was actually this past weekend. Uh, today is Tuesday, and it would have just happened just this past Saturday. Um, I attended my local Level 3 USA Hockey officiating seminar, and uh, something interesting happened uh, when we were there. Something I... Uh, didn't expect. Um, we actually had a visit from two NHL referees, uh, Frederick Lecouillet and Francois St. Laurent, two guys that live down here in the Southeast, decided to, or they got invited to come over and, and talk to us. And uh, so they showed up and uh, had a little talk with the referees for, oh, probably about 45 minutes or so. And it was kind of interesting. Actually, it was very interesting uh, to have a little meet and greet with those guys. So I know I mentioned it to you, Steve, a little bit. Yes, uh, you did. I, I was I was waiting to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't really given you any details. So so basically, all they did was you know they they got up in front of the room and um, um, the first thing they did is Francois Saint Laurent wanted to give us an example. It, it, you know, the level three seminar, we talk less about the fundamentals like positioning and, and, you know, identifying the calls. We go, we talk more in, in the upper levels, more about game management, um, you know, talk about the gray areas. We, you know, sometimes a call is a call, you know, and sometimes it's not, you know, hockey officiating is always a challenge and, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of gray area and, and, you know, they talk about the art and the science of, what they call game management. And one of the things that he talked about was particularly now in this day and age where everybody's got a phone in or, you know, in their pocket, which there's also a, a camera attached to that phone. He wanted to remind us all that you never know when the camera's watching. And he showed a clip from a hockey night in Canada game. And, and, you know, he, he, it was uh, Winnipeg versus uh, Tampa Bay. Uh, he was one of the two referees that night, and they had an incident in that game, and I can't remember the players involved, um, but it was a Tampa Bay player. A Winnipeg player came across the blue line, across the middle of the ice, and got laid out by a Tampa Bay defenseman. And when you looked at the replay a couple of times over, the Winnipeg player went down in a heap and, and was hurt and was helped off the ice. Um, but if you looked at it closely, it was actually a legal hit. Uh, what had happened was is the Winnipeg player was started to lose control of the puck and was reaching out for it just as the hit was delivered. So he got laid out, like laid out flat. And um, all four referees got together, had a discussion, uh, or all four officials, the two referees and the two linesmen, got together, had a, a discussion, and determined they all agreed that it was a clean hit and that no penalty was going to be called. Well, um, the uh, coach of the Winnipeg Jets at the time, and it is, uh, actually I believe he still is, Paul Maurice, uh, went completely ballistic, lost his mind, and you know the camera showed him arguing with, with uh, St. Laurent and... It was right at the end of a period, and you know they had a big argument. Saint Laurent ended up 
not only um, not penalizing the hit, but he ended up giving the Winnipeg a bench minor for abusive officials because um, he didn't go into details on what exactly Maurice said to him, but he said it was of a personal nature and it crossed the line. So he gave him a penalty. So that really sent him off the edge. So now Paul Maurice is really upset. And then right after that, the period ended, everybody went to their respective locker rooms. uh, And apparently things were said in the locker rooms. Again, he didn't go into many details. Um, And then they came back out and the camera shows Maurice coming back out on the bench to start the, the next period. And he's still hollering at St. Laurent and the other officials. Uh, for oh. what just went down right at the end of the last period. And then St. Laurent went over and talked to him. Essentially, I think what end, ultimately ended up happening is he ended up kicking him out of the game. And so Maurice goes and takes off, right? He leaves. They're getting ready to drop the puck. And the camera goes right close in on the referee. And the referee looks at a couple <laughs> of the players as they're getting ready. I mean, literally... They're in the face-off, going to line up, and you, you see St. Laurent start laughing right before he drops, and then they, they show him drop the puck, and, and, and the play goes on. Well, he didn't think anything of it. The next day, the Twitter storm happened, where everybody in Canada, particularly the uh, Winnipeg fans, were up in arms because St. Laurent is laughing about having just thrown out Paul Maurice. Oh, man. So... <laughs> You know, he, he talked about how this was the most embarrassing moment of his career in terms of, you know, being viewed as a professional. And he explained what actually did happen is right before the camera went to him, Dustin Bufflin skated by and cracked a joke. And he, again, he wouldn't go into details because we, we asked him, well, what did he say to you to make you laugh? He, and, you know, he said, well, some things are just, you know, stay on the ice between between the players and uh and the officials they don't they don't want some of that stuff that's said on the ice getting out in the public so he didn't go into details on what was said but he just said bufflin uh who plays for the jets uh bufflin cracked a joke and uh that's what made him laugh but it was perceived the wrong way because right as he was you know going to drop the puck the camera goes on him and they show him laughing <laughs> after after at you know just having getting rid of uh, Paul Maurice. So, yeah, so he said, just always remember, you know, you never know when the camera is rolling. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, there's a time, there's a time to joke around, there's a time to be serious, and that wasn't a time to be joking around, and he got caught, and, you know, uh, you know, he got, and of course it was on national TV, he says, everybody in Canada uh, was watching, he says, in Canada, Hockey Night in Canada is basically, you know, everybody watches it. On Saturday night, there's two shows that that are watched in Canada. It's Game One and Game Two of Hockey <laughs> Night in Canada. So, you know, it was it was a big deal up there. But uh, anyway, that was that was one of the stories that he told. And then and then they went on and and took a bunch of questions. You know, and it was all about uh, you know what's it like to be an NHL official and what's it you know you know day in the life and. And uh, and he did say that one of his favorite uh, uh, one of his favorite things to do is to throw pucks to little kids. He says it gives him a good feeling that you know to see the kid you know kid's face and it makes their day when he gets to throw a puck to them. Uh, and then of course uh, the other referee uh, Freddie Lecouye uh, cracked a joke at that point. He says he says yeah, but when you were single, you weren't throwing pucks to the to the little kids. <laughs> <laughs> he was th- he was throwing them to the girls, <laughs> so everybody liked that one. So so it was, it was pretty interesting just to get the perspective of two uh, current and active NHL officials, both of which have worked full time for the NHL. So and and you that was. and and when you and when you go to Hurricanes games, those two guys usually are at least one, if not both, of the uh, referees for the Hurricanes games. I guess they live in the area here yeah. and they travel around the Southeast doing games for, uh, for most of the uh, Southeast teams. This game that he, was, that he showed us the clip from was actually in Tampa. Oh, okay. So he was down there doing a game. But yeah, uh, both of these guys are both uh, Canadian. 
Uh, mm. They both spoke with a pretty heavy French accent, so they're both from Quebec. But uh, they're, I guess they live not too far from this area. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, from what I understand, the NHL puts officials in all the NHL cities just just to spread them around. So, mm -hmm. But it was, it was pretty interesting. You know, there were more stories that were told and such, but... Uh, but Have was, either one of them officiated in the Stanley Cup or the, the champion, conference championships, or did they? Did uh, they Saint Laurent has uh, seven games of playoff experience, mm -hmm. but I think it was all in round one. Uh, Le Coulier, uh doesn't have any playoff experience at all, so th these are two fairly young guys, both are thirty-nine years old, uh, and some of the the and the way the the way they work, uh, they explain how it works with the NHL guys. There's thirty-three linesmen. 33 referees for the whole league that are full-time uh, employees of the league. And uh, when the playoffs start, that list gets d cut down to 20 and 20. Oh. So 13 guys are basically done when the regular season is done. And then at the start of the second round, the list gets cut down to 12. And then for the, for the uh, conference finals, it gets cut down to eight. And then for the Stanley Cup final, it's down to four and four. <laughs> and uh, it's all done through, you know, the league head office and evaluations. And he said there's a little bit of politics, too, involved. <laughs> yeah, I bet that's something. Generally, the guys that have been around the longest are the ones that <laughs> usually end up working most of the playoff games. Yeah. And these very guys. Interesting. So, yeah, it was very interesting. So. Very interesting. But yeah. anyway, that was my week. <laughs> uh, well, let's go ahead and move on to some of the news that's been happening over the last, well, almost two weeks now since we last recorded. Uh, and we'll go ahead and start with just uh, some of the signings that went on. Of course, about a day after we last recorded, uh, we got word of the Jimmy VC signing. And we found out that he went to your New York Rangers. That's right. I was thrilled. I was glad to hear that. Uh, it, it jived with all those news stories coming out of New York, and rather suddenly, all of a sudden, there was a flurry of activity because I really didn't think the Rangers uh, – I really didn't think that, that uh, Bessie was interested in New York. Uh, but as it turns out, he was very interested, and it really came down you – know, you know what they say? They say that the thing that made – that pushed the, the, the thing over the edge for him – was his interview or meeting or whatever you want to say with Chris Drury, the former captain of the Rangers, who now is director of player personnel for the team. Yep. Uh, he he's a former Boston U guy and a former Hobie Baker winner, and uh, that had a big impact on uh, on uh, Vessi when he talked to him. Uh, everything that uh, Chris had to say, and of course. Then the questions become very relevant, you know, when you're in the in the meeting with somebody like that, who you you know you aspire to be in the position that that Chris Drury, uh, where I, I can see that that really made a difference. So uh, if you read, you know, the articles I read that really pushed it over the edge for them. Um, I think he's going to play. I think I think opening night he's going to play, and I think he's going to be on the second line. I, I think he's going to fit right in. It's going to depend on how well he plays. But from everything I'm hearing, he's a virtual lock on the starting roster. And, you know, I'm just going off what I'm hearing, uh, articles I've read. So uh, he can contribute right away, and the Rangers, by golly, they need it. Uh, they really do. And I, and I, you know, and I, and, I, and I follow a lot of the Boston media as well, being a Bruins fan. And I was hearing all of the, the in the days following him announcing his uh, – signing with the Rangers, all the sky is falling stuff, but you know, and then, and then some of the Boston media was like, well, you know, it's no big deal. This, he's not going to do anything anyway, because look how many Hobie Baker winners have gone on to great things in the NHL. The list is pretty short. That's true. <laughs> we had one, uh, you know, along the lines, Wayne, of what you're saying. Um, and I'm trying to, to remember his name. I know, I know I, uh, uh, I'm going to forget his name, but we had one not long ago in the last five years. We had a Hobie Baker winner, and they traded him to Tampa Bay, and he, he fizzled out. I don't hear about him anymore, um, and his name escapes me right now. 
uh, I can probably bring it up, but um, they they uh, they've had their experiences with um, you know with Hobie Baker winners, so uh, maybe uh, maybe this will work out. Matt Gilroy is the guy I'm thinking. Oh, of. okay, yeah, Matt Gilroy. And, yep, and uh, he uh, he did well for a year or two, and then he he that was it, you know. So, yeah, I mean, there have been a few that have done well. Obviously, Johnny Goudreau, Jack Eichel, Paul mm-hmm. Correa, probably three of the best known right off the top of my head. Um, but I just pulled up the list of the past winners. Before Goudreau, you had Drew LeBlanc, Jack Connolly, Andy Maley, Blake Jeffreyon, Matt Gilroy, Kevin Porter, Ryan Duncan. Um, you know, there's not a lot of big names there of yeah. guys that are that are Hobie Baker winners. Yeah. Um, Matt Carl, 2006, he, he's still playing in the league. Um, Jordan Leopold played quite a bit. Ryan Miller, obviously, is uh, one of the best goalies that has worn the USA sweater in a while. Right. And, of course, Chris Drury. Yep. Um, Had a successful career. Yeah. Brendan Morrison, that's a big name from the 90s, early 2000s. But yeah, there just aren't a lot of studs that <laughs> we would consider stud players that that have won the um, Hobie Baker Award. I guess it doesn't automatically translate into um, into um, you know great NHL success. Mm-hmm. You know, and on a personal note, uh, I've never told you this, but on the you know, speaking of the Hobie Baker Award, I just saw a picture of it here on this website. Um, I've actually held that trophy before. Oh, have you really? Yeah. My years uh, that I uh, went to school at the University of Maine, I actually worked at the arena there at mm-hmm. Alfond Arena as a Zamboni driver. And during the time that I was working there, they were going through a lot of renovations and we had to move essentially their whole trophy case from from a, a lounge area that that they were on display to a new display area near the front lobby of the arena. Mm-hmm. And um, and I got to, uh, I didn't actually carry the trophy all that way because it was about, you know, three, four hundred feet of a walk. And that thing's heavy. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> it is <Dang>. extremely heavy. <laughs> uh, but I moved it from, you know, from the original trophy case to a cart. And then we pushed it, you know, along with a couple other trophies over to the new trophy case and then picked it up and put it into its new trophy case. But yeah, that thing, the the statue on top is all brass and, and there's a big block on the bottom. That's essentially, uh, I don't know if it's acrylic. I don't think it's crystal. It's, it's, it's not like that. Uh, I think it's like, it's a glass of some kind, um, because it seems like it's heavier than acrylic. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's a big glass block on the bottom and then the brass trophy on top. And it, yeah, that thing's heavy. That thing weighs a good 30 pounds is my estimation. But yeah, that's my, (laughs) my claim to fame to (laughs) to the Hobie (laughs) Baker award. And it was the, because what happens is when a school wins it, um, they get one to, to put on display at the school. There's multiple Hobie Baker awards. It's not, it's not like the Stanley cup where there's only one. Right. Um, when a player at your school wins it, you get one. Your school gets one to put on display. Mm-hmm. And the one we got um, is essentially the one for to show Maine has had two Hobie Baker Awards. They had Scott Pellerin back in 1991 or two, 1992. And then Paul Correa the, final, the following year. Mm-hmm. And that trophy is there, you know, you see the display they set up has the trophy in the center with, with photographs and jerseys uh, of both players hanging uh, there in the arena. But yeah, that's, that, that was pretty cool to, to be able to carry that trophy among others. You know, the, I've carried their national championship trophies and, and uh, uh, conference championship trophies and, and such as well. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was kind of yeah. fun. It was kind of fun working at that rink. You got to see a lot of behind the scenes. Uh, stuff but anyway keeping it with the rangers theme though um you got brandon peary who just recently signed uh with the rangers as well another forward right coming over from anaheim and uh i you know that i all i know they signed him to a one-year deal 
the art the article I read said he was the best of the unrestricted free free agents that was available. Now whether or not that's true, I don't know. Um, but again, the Rangers sure can use uh, someone uh, that can come in and uh, you know pick up pick up minutes and and score, get points. Yeah. That's what they need. But it raises a concern for me for the Rangers. Now, obviously, Vesey uh, had signed with the with the thinking or, you know, the speculation around was he was going to sign with a team that could give him top six minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, and now they've added Vesey. They've added Peary. It seems to me that the Rangers are getting awfully crowded up front. Well, they got a lot of talent. Yeah. Uh, whether, whether <laughs> I, just or not, I just don't see how VC set, fits in. Yeah. In, well, in, the, in the top six. Um, I, I think he will. I, I, it's, it's all going to depend on how he plays when he, when he comes to, to camp and, and how they do in the preseason games, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and if he doesn't play well, he, he won't, he won't, uh, he won't garner as many minutes. I mean, it's all going to, that's going to be on, on Jimmy VC. Yeah. But, um, in terms of what I'm hearing, uh, they're very impressed with, with his, uh, play and, uh, the, the Rangers need defensemen. There's no question about it. Uh, but, but we're not in the position right now that we've got any over the, over the off season. Yeah. And that's the real, that's the real area where they need him. And, yeah. Unfortunately, it's it's not it, it may not work out before the season starts this year. But uh, yeah, I'm looking know. at I'm looking at their forwards on um, I'm just looking at a list of forwards on on General Fanager, and at left wing, which is what they've got VC listed as, you've got Rick Nash, Chris Kreider, um, Tanner Glass, VC, and Nathan Gerby. And at center, you've got Stepan, Miller, Zabinijad, Lapierre, Piri. Oh, you got Lindbergh and Joris, but there's no way they're going to make the lineup. Not with those guys. And at right wing, you've got Hayes, Grabner, Zuccarello, and Jesper Foss. I, I, you know, I don't see how they're going to put VC at first or second line left wing when you've got Kreider and Nash there. <laughs> well, um, I mean, I mean, it's, it's, it could be a worse problem to have. They're, they're uh, very deep up front. That's for sure. Yeah. Unless they're planning on making a trade. I've heard rumblings that they may be looking to move Rick Nash, but yeah, I, I've but heard that he, too, but, but he's I, got I a think, no trade. So I, I, I think, uh, I think that, uh, you, you know, it's going to, Maybe it's the third line that he that he falls into. Yeah, I see him more as a third line, third line winger, and going up from there. But um, you know, I, I read an article where they said he'd be he'd be in the second line. But that, that we'll 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 see as the season goes along. They're saying he's playing very well. Um, Unless he wants to play the right side and he plays second line behind Zuccarello. But that would put Kevin Hayes back to the third line. Yeah. So, you never know. He might he may be on the same line with Kevin Hayes, and that's you know he doesn't have any he doesn't have any experience playing center, does he? No, no, I, not to my knowledge. No, okay. Um, well, even to, even then, he'd still be behind Zabinajad and Stepan. So, yeah, I I don't think he I don't think he's cut out for. Center. I kind of see him as a, as a um, Peary with Hayes on the right and uh, Vesey on the left. On the third line, and that could be that could be the way it turns out. Yeah. So, oh. anyway, so yeah, the Rangers are still still working to improve their team, uh, but like you said, I think they need to add some D and stop adding so many forwards. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and that may be coming. That may yeah. be coming. Uh, you, you just never know. I I I've looked at their prospects and I've I've done some reading, and I don't uh, you know. Uh, I don't know at this time how that's going to all shape out. I think they're going to keep Dylan McElrath this this year. I think he's going to probably get a full year uh, as as a defenseman uh, with with Girardi, Stahl, McDonough, and Klein. You got four solid defensemen. Yep. 
and and I think uh, you know the likes of Dylan McElrath and and uh, uh, the, there's one or two others, perhaps one of these guys, Adam Clendenning, they signed Nick Holden. One of those two guys may uh, may be taking a, the sixth slot. But we're really missing Keith Yandel. I it, I'd really hurt to lose Keith Yandel. That to me. Uh, it, it's we haven't come up with a player to match that. Yeah, and that's going he run the power play. There, the, you know, forty or so points as a defenseman the last three years in a row, and he's one of three guys that's done it. Um, I he, you know, he could be a Norris Trophy winner. Really could be. Yeah, uh, in the future. But you know, Chicago has proven uh, in the past that uh, it really only takes four solid D to win a cup. So, yeah, you, you know, the four that you've got are. Pretty good, uh, pretty good guys to have. So, oh yeah, so that's not that bad. So anyway, let's go on to some Bruins news. Um, Dominic Moore, and it actually, as we record this, uh, it just came within the last hour. Dominic Moore has signed with the Boston Bruins, a one-year, nine hundred thousand one-way contract. Uh, so it looks like the Bruins aren't done either. Again, I think that they have the same problem that the Rangers have in the f- in the fact that. Uh, uh, Bruins fans are not too confident in the defensemen that they have going into the season. Mm-hmm. Um, so the fact that they're still adding forwards, <laughs> they just seem to be following right along with what the Rangers are doing. Right. Uh, and it seemed like um, the Bruins kind of went on pause for a little while while they waited to see uh, if VC would sign with them or not. And now that obviously they're not going to get him, they've moved on and, they went ahead and signed the ex Ranger Dominic Moore to a one year deal. So don't yeah. know much. Don't know much about Dominic. Uh, you can probably tell me more about him than uh, than he's I know. A, he well, number one, he's a great locker room guy. He's he's very good at uh, his experience. Uh, lends itself very well to the to discussions, uh, team uh, team meetings, et cetera, et cetera. Cool. He was always counted on by the Rangers in that area, but he contributes, you know, he's not going to be, uh, he's not going to get uh, 20 goals a year uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, 30 or 40 assists. It's, it's not the type of player that he is, but, uh, he, in terms of, uh, getting on third or fourth line and making a difference, uh, I can guarantee you, uh, that he will. Uh, and you know, I, I'm very happy for Boston because I think he's a, he's a good player. Uh, he's had some some hard knocks. Um, you know, he'd lost his wife to cancer, but uh, he's come through it and he's a stronger person because of it. And uh, they'll be very happy that they have Dominic, Dominic Moore. For sounds hour, sounds like sounds like they got him more for his locker room capabilities, because one of the one of the big knocks on the Bruins last year was the, the lack of leadership in the room, particularly after. Uh, you know, guys like uh, uh, Jack Boy, uh, Jack Boychuk, Johnny Boychuk left the team, uh, and and uh, you know, guys like him and Andrew Ferrance and uh, Sean Thornton. Once those guys left, those guys were key locker room guys in their Stanley Cup run. And uh, once those guys left, there was really nobody to replace that that dynamic in in on that team. Mm-hmm. So I think Dominic Moore is a, is a guy that they signed to help them with that. And, of course, David Backus is is being said to uh, be that kind of guy, too. So You got a winner in that guy. Yeah, yeah. David Backus, for sure. So, yep. so anyway, time will tell to see what these these new guys are going to do for our teams. But anyway, we'll, we'll go ahead and move on. And I'll actually skim through down uh, these just in the interest of time um, because some of these are minor signings. Obviously, there's no huge names here, but... Uh, um, the, you know, the, I've got a list of uh, signings, other signings that have happened since we last recorded. Uh, Max Jones uh, signed with the Ducks. Mm-hmm. Y- Yuri Hoodler signed with Dallas. Uh, that'll give him some nice third line uh, uh, offense for yes. them. Uh, Brandon Prust has a tryout deal for Toronto, so he's not a guaranteed contract. Um, he's just, he's basically gonna. They're giving him the opportunity. If he makes the team, great. If not, he'll sign probably a minor league deal somewhere. Cody you, you said know, real, real, real quick with uh, Brandon Prust. Yeah. Uh, I think we will see him in the Maple Leafs Jersey. They have in the past always had players like Colton Moore, guys that get out there and fight, uh, do the dirty work. 
uh, and he that's exactly what type of player he is, and he fits that mold. So, I, you know, and I, he's played for the Rangers. He's, he'll be a fan favorite. I, I think he's he stands a good chance. Yeah, and they well, they need a guy like him to protect uh, Austin Matthews. So, so it's there prob- you go. That's probably good point, uh, yeah, probably uh, kind of what they're thinking there. Cody Ceci, uh signed with Ottawa as well. Jonas Enroth signed with the Kings. Uh, Sean Monahan uh, signed. Uh, he was a restricted free agent. He finally signed a big contract with Calgary, a seven-year deal. Um, but they're still working on Johnny Hockey or Johnny Goudreau. Uh, he hasn't signed yet. He's the one big name that Calgary has yet to sign. But I'm hearing rumblings that it's going to happen here uh, within the next week or so. You'll see him get signed. Uh, Logan Brown signed with Ottawa. Thomas DePauly, yes. uh, I believe he played for Notre Dame. He signed with Pittsburgh. Right. So who knows if he'll make the team or not. Chris Higgins has a tryout contract uh, with the Calgary Flames. And Jarrett Stahl uh, got a tryout contract for Columbus. These guys that got tryout contracts or tryout deals, they're all over 30 guys. So it seems like those teams don't want to commit to a guy like that. They want to wait and see what they look like when they come into camp. And uh, they're veteran players, and they'll give them contracts if, uh, if they can make the team. Mm-hmm. But I think the tryout deal helps the player in that they're not committed to that team long term. So they can, they can uh, you know, either party can go their own separate ways at the end of the tryout. So that's all I have for uh, signings, unless uh, you have any no, more that, that you saw. That, you know, I, I had a list of them here, and that touched on, on everyone and, and plus some that, that yeah. I did not have. Uh, I saw where Thomas DePauly signed, and, you know, he did real well with Notre Dame, too. Yeah. So, okay, well, the next, the next thing I have on my list is uh, the upcoming prospect tournaments. Uh, Obviously, we're hitting the end of August here. Today is the 30th, so there's only one day left in August. And once we hit September, everything starts rolling for real this time. Um, And the first thing that gets going on the NHL calendar, uh, and it's not really an official league sanction uh, thing, but um, 27 of the 30 NHL teams are going to be participating. Actually, we found out today 29 of the 30 NHL teams are are going to be participating in some form of a prospect tournament or prospect exhibition game against other NHL teams uh, before the real preseason schedule gets going. Uh, Most of those games take place between the 11th uh, and the 16th of September. Um, And I'll just run down through the tournaments and who's participating. Um, The biggest one and the oldest one, this one's been going for several years now, is the Traverse City Prospect Tournament. Uh, that takes place between the 11th and 15th, and there's eight teams going to Detroit uh, to participate in that. Uh, that uh, Obviously, the Red Wings will be there, Dallas, St. Louis, Chicago, Minnesota, the Rangers, Carolina Hurricanes, and uh, Columbus. Mm-hmm. Um, Toronto is, is hosting a rookie tournament uh, from the 11th to the 13th. That's going to be four teams, Ottawa, Montreal, Toronto, Pittsburgh. Uh, Vancouver is going to be hosting one called the Young Stars Classic from the 11th to the 14th. Uh, Winnipeg, Calgary, Vancouver, Edmonton. So you're basically Canadian Western teams. Uh, the next one on my list is Tampa Bay. Uh, they are going to be hosting the Tampa Bay Rookie Tournament in Estero, Florida um, from the 12th to the 15th. And you're going to have Florida, Tampa Bay, Nashville, Washington. Uh, interesting note on that Estero, Florida. That's a small ECHL arena. There's only about 5,000 seats in that arena. And it's kind of interesting. They, they hold all these tournaments. They're holding this tournament. They also hold a, a college tournament during the Christmas break where they invite, right. they invite four college teams down there to, to play a tournament in that arena. And then, of course, the rest of the year, there's also uh, an ECHL team. The Florida Everblades play there. Um, that is very interesting, Wayne. Yeah, so that, that the people who own that arena are obviously doing some things to get some good hockey to uh, come down to that, that small little arena uh, in Estero. And I believe Estero, Florida is somewhere close to Tampa Bay. Um, it's not far from that area. <coughs> it's in that part of the state anyway. 
Uh, the Buffalo uh, Prospects Challenge, that is three teams hosted by the Sabres. That's going to have Buffalo, the Boston Bruins, and the Devils. And right. the rest of these are just two teams that are have agreements to get together to play either a couple of games or a single game. San Jose Anaheim will be playing two games uh, in San Jose on the 12th and 13th. Uh, L.A. and Arizona will be playing two games on the 15th and 16th against each other. And the Islanders and the Flyers are going to be playing a single game at the Islanders practice facility in Eisenhower Park, New York on the 21st uh, of September. So that leaves the Avalanche as the only team, uh, at least that we know of, uh, not participating in any kind of a prospect's uh, tournament or a prospects challenge where, you know, their prospects would play another team's prospects. So I'm not sure exactly. Uh, maybe it'll come down that they're going to play somebody. Um, who knows? Who knows what they're, what they're going to do. But right now the, the uh, Avalanche are on the outside looking in in the, in the prospects games. And you, do you think that has anything to do with, with uh, Patrick Roa? No, I don't. Um, I think, I think these these things are set well in advance. Mm-hmm. They probably made these plans during the season last year. So, um, I think that's just a coincidence. I don't think that has anything to do with the Wa situation. Um, they're just not, uh, and maybe they are going to do something. They just haven't announced it yet. If if they are going to do something. Um, but anyway, and actually, I think now that I think of it, I think their prospects might be playing. I know they do a red, a red, white or red, blue game at the University of Denver, but that involves the whole team, not just the prospects. Oh, okay. I think that takes place during during their their uh, training camp where they go to the University of Denver at the University of Denver's rink. And, and split the whole team, the 40-man roster, or the ones that can go anyway, um, into two smaller teams, and they play each other that way. Call it a red-white game or blue-red game. I'm, I'm not sure what they call it, but it's one of those style games. Um, so I, know, I do know they do that, but that may be all that they're doing. So other than the prospect stuff, um, we also, coming up, very shortly, in, in fact, even sooner than the prospect uh, games, um, training camps for the World Cup get started. Yes. Less than a week now. I'm getting excited. <laughs> yeah, it, it's coming down quickly. All all eight teams are going to be practicing starting on the 5th of September. That's just, what, one, two, three, four, six days from now. A hop, skip, and a jump. Six days. <laughs> so they start practicing. So. Yeah. And then uh, their pre-tournament games will be taking place uh, shortly after that. Um, Team Russia, Team Czechoslovakia, uh, Team Sweden, and Finland, all four of those teams are doing their initial practices and early uh, tournament games. Or not, they're not tournament games, pre-tournament games right. over in Europe. Uh, the Czechs and the Russians will play a home and home uh, against each other before they come over here. They're going to play um, each other once in Prague and once in, I believe, Saint Petersburg, Russia. And then, and then Sweden and Finland will play each other once in Finland, once in Sweden, before they come over here. That's very. So the rest of the teams are going to have their uh, practices at various rinks around. Uh, the USA and Canada. So, uh, I believe North America. No, I believe North America is practicing in Canada, and the and the Europeans are definitely practicing. Uh, I believe in Washington D.C. is where the Europeans are are ha- holding their practice. That is, I did not know that either. Yep. So, uh, with the World Cup in mind, we do have a few changes to the World Cup roster. Um, and both and all the changes that I have anyway uh, are for Team Sweden and Team Canada. For Team Sweden, Jonas Enroth, Hampus Lindholm, and Rickard Raquel 
are all in, and they're replacing Robin Lehner, uh, Nicholas Cronwall, and Alex Steen. Right. Uh, as all three of those players are injured. Uh, for Canada, Jay Bowmeister's in, Logan Couture is in, uh, Duncan Keith and Jamie Benn are out with injuries. And on the Duncan Keith one, uh, from different radio shows and uh, podcasts I listen to, um, people are speculating that his injury is not as bad as he's making it out to being. That they, some people think that he's just uh, he just doesn't want to play in this tournament. Um, can't say as I blame him. You know, Chicago um, has played a lot of long playoff seasons. Yeah, you know those Chicago players have played a lot of a lot of games, and defensemen in t- particular take a beating. So, I I think uh, I, I'm going to step out on a limb here. It very well could be what you say, Wayne. Uh, but uh, in terms of Duncan Keith, uh, if, if if you know a lot of people think Patrick Kane, Jonathan Taves, whatever, but my if there's going to be a player out of those three that's going to make the Hall of Fame, it's going to be Duncan Keith. For the, the Stanley Cups and the Norris trophies now he's played. So yeah. he may just want to rest. Yeah. You know, uh, he did, may just want to rest. And, you know, he probably is injured. I'm not, you know, I'm not knocking that, but I also don't blame him in a way for, uh, for wanting to sit it out and, you know, start the season more fresh yeah. than he has. I mean, those, those world-class players do play a lot of hockey, particularly the ones that are on good teams. Um, now world cup in mind. Um, did you see, Corey Schneider's goalie pads. Yeah, th- those those are cool. I I did, uh, and and uh, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, <laughs> I hope he wear. I hope they'll let him wear them. I guess right. Well, they'll let him wear them. It's just a matter of fact. Will he play? Uh, yeah. I mean, will you know how much will he play, uh, or is is more like it? Obviously, he'll play in the uh, the pre tournament warm up games, but um, you know. Question is, I, I, you know, when I saw those pads, I now say I hope he ends up being the starter for America because <laughs> yeah. those pads are cool. And if you haven't seen them, basically you see, you know, if you picture a set of goalie pads, the areas above the kneecap are, are dark blue with, stri- with stars on them. And then yeah. below the kneecap are the white and red stripes. So it looks kind of like an American flag turned on its side. Yeah. So it looks, it looks really, really cool. Yeah. Um, very unique and uh, something I look forward to seeing. Um, and over the past uh, past uh, couple of weeks, there's been several uh, goalie masks that have, have been revealed. And one that caught my attention was the Team Europe uh, goalie mask. I don't know if you saw that one. Um, it's essentially, it looks like, uh, you know, they've got the goalie mask looks like a puzzle that's been put together. You know, you see the outline of all the puzzle pieces. And yeah. then... And then painted on top of the puzzle pieces, and basically starting on one side of the mask, going up over the top and down, down to the other side. Um, you see all the different country flags of all the different countries that are represented by by Team Europe. I have not seen that. So, that's, that's really cool. So, so that one that one was the one that kind of caught my eye too. So um, it's going to be interesting to, to see um, all the players with their. Well, goalies in particular with their unique uh, masks and pads and everything else to, to match their team colors. It's not something we've seen in the past um, yeah. in these world competitions. You, you typically see these players wear their, you know, their regular gear, their NHL team gear, partially because it's broken in and it fits better. Um, but, you know, and, and the players feel more comfortable with gear that's been broken in. Um, but this this time around, we're actually getting to see stuff that is uh, that is made specifically for the country team. So that's good to see. Yeah, that is. Uh, I I think Quickie's going to be the starter, though, right? Don't you think? Yeah, I think I think ultimately Quick will be the starter. But it could it could go Schneider um, if Schneider outplays him in the in the uh, pre tournament games. Yeah. Um, you could see, or they could be quick with the leash. I mean, he, both goalies are very good. Yes, they are. Uh, both and, goalies. And you got Ben Bishop in there too, you know, so. Yeah, and you got Ben Bishop. Um, and I think for Ben Bishop's sake, he shouldn't play because, you know, he seems to be the one that struggles more with injuries than the others. Hmm. So, yeah, so um, the next story I've got, Jared Bednar uh, is going to be the coach for the Avalanche. He replaces Patrick Waugh. We talked about it on the last episode. Uh, Patrick Waugh is getting fired, but they hadn't announced their new coach yet. 
Um, and he will take over the helm as the Avs coach. I believe he was the head coach of the Erie um, Monsters uh, that's right. of the American Hockey League. That's right. Um, so, And they just won the Calder Cup. So that's right. He's coming off a winning season uh, up there in Lake Erie. So hopefully he can, well, for the Avalanche fans anyway, he can uh, turn that into success at the NHL level. Yeah, and that's a hockey crazy place too. Erie, Pennsylvania. <laughs> that is. I'm telling you, I know a late a girl from that area. And, really? Uh, yeah. And it's a crazy. They love hockey in that area. Are they Columbus fans there or? Uh, she's a Flyers fan, so I I don't know. Uh, but I I couldn't tell you. It might okay. be Pittsburgh is is pretty big up there too. I'm sure. Okay. Uh, but that's a crazy place, you know. And these guys that win the Calder Cup and then they come in the NHO, you know, uh, Blashill. Uh, yep. I don't know if he won the Calder Cup, but, you know, Detroit was grooming him for a long time. And uh, he did very well. Got him in the playoffs his first year. Hmm. So I'm I'm excited to see this kind of stuff happening. Well, good. Yeah, and it's always good to see a new face uh, come into the league instead of, the you know, the recycling all the old NHL guys from the past. Yeah. So next story I've got, P.K. Subban, um, I thought was kind of interesting, re- re- released a clothing line. <laughs> and I don't know if you saw the story. Uh, they showed a picture of him and his two brothers uh, modeling uh, some of the suits that he's going to be selling on. I don't know if they're going to be selling in stores or on a website or what. I didn't look that yeah. far into the story, but yeah. But, uh, you know, this is something, the reason I noticed, this is something you wouldn't have seen if he was playing for the Montreal Canadiens. That's right. They would That's not, a- they would not allow PK to go off on his own and have, and it's probably something he's been wanting to do for a long time. And now that he's with, you know, the Nashville Predators, who's, um, you know, they're going to allow him to do some of this stuff. And I think you're going to see more and more of this stuff, this type of stuff out of PK. Uh, he'll probably release a rap album here pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if anybody can pull it off, you know, P.K. Subban can. Yeah. And I think it's good, you know, for the NHL, drawing attention to to uh, to the NHL. I, I think it's not a bad thing. I, I was actually, I chuckled a little bit, but I'm glad to see it, you know. Well, he's always one of the more sharp-dressed guys in the, in he the league. He sure is. So. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I went, were you here, uh, were you living in the area when the uh, All-Star game came to uh, Carolina in two, yes. 2011? Yes. Yes, I, I took a bunch of that weekend off um, so that I could attend a lot of the as much of the stuff as I could while they were there. And we went to the red carpet um, the night of the skills competition. We went to the red carpet where they had the players. They dropped them off. And, you, you're, you know, you're familiar with the PNC arena there. They dropped them off out at the street that goes right in between the football stadium and the hockey arena. Yeah. And they had a red carpet that basically went up along, you know, one side, then crossed in front of the arena and then went into through the uh, VIP entrance at the arena. So, you know, and the fans were, you know, they had a fence and the fans could line up, you know, on both sides of the red carpet and watch the players. The players would stop and sign autographs. And um, anyway, when he came through, he was part, you know, one of the all-stars that year, Um, you know, he was definitely one of the sharper dressed guys of the of the forty or so guys that came through, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I I hate I missed that. Um, that's that's several years back, and uh, I I just didn't go. Uh, but I, I I hate I missed that. I bet that was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. He was one of the sharper dressed guys, and one of the other ones that I remember in particular was uh, Mark Andre Fleury. He was he was uh, pretty sharp dressed that year too. So. Um, mm-hmm. So the rest of them, of course, they all wear nice suits and all, but you know those two guys kind of stood out above above the others, uh, where the other guys wore more traditional suits, mm-hmm. traditional colored suits, or let's say. Um, but anyway, so we already touched on the World Cup practice schedule, so I can go ahead and skip on to the next one. Um, obvi- you know, obviously, they again they start on the fifth of September. Uh, Florida traded. Uh, Dave Bolin and Lawson Krause to Arizona for a 2017 third round pick and 2018 conditional, I believe it's a second round or a third round pick. I can't remember. 
I didn't have that part right written down, but uh, the condition essentially means if if uh, I think is if Kraus plays more than ten games this year, uh, Florida will get that second pick. Okay, that twenty eighteen pick, um, and all all you know. A lot of people are saying he's going to make the team because he's going to a team that's got a lot of young players on it, yeah, um, and a lot of room for um, for young guys to make the team. Um, so that was the only trade that took place since our last uh, episode, right? And, and the one thing that jumps out on me with that one is uh, I kind of question why Florida did it. I don't know what you think. <laughs> um, I, yeah, you, you know, how, how well, uh, I'll be honest with you. I don't know a lot about Lawson Krauss. How, how well did those guys fit in on Florida as far as a team that is probably going to make the playoffs this year? Okay. Uh, and, uh, and with what they have coming to, to bear, you know, do, do they, uh, make a move like that to free up room for people like Keith Yandel? And, uh, and well, that's, and that's the thing. There's, there's Florida already had plenty of cap space. I mean, after the trade, they now have 9.2 million before the trade. Um, well, Kraus was in an entry level deal. So it only been about a million uh, less than that. So it's not like Florida needed to, uh, free up some cap space. They already had 8 million before the trade. Yeah. And there's there's no free agent player out there right now that's available that would garner that much money, so right. you can't you can't think that they did it to free up a guy. Yeah, um, they signed Yandel to a a big contract, but I, I'm not I don't have general manager in front of me right now. But they signed Yandel to six plus uh, million. Yeah, uh, but they still got plenty more room to go. Okay, in, in addition to that. So, I, you know, it's clear that they were clearing Boland's contract for some reason. I I just don't know why. Um, It was kind of a head scratcher. Unless they're, you know, Lawson Krause is projected to be an NHL regular uh, eventually. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's not likely that he was going to make Florida's roster this year, but he could make the roster out in out in Phoenix. Oh yeah. Um. So. You know, and you and I, and you and I have touched on it in the past. The, the the Arizona Coyotes got a a wealth of talent in their defensive core. Yeah. Well, now uh, they yeah. just added a nice forward. Yep. So, I, I I love what that what Phoenix is doing there. I mean, they are they are stockpiling a lot of young good players. Yeah. Um, you know, they're they're kind of the Edmonton Oilers like two years ago. Okay. Yep. <laughs> so that's right. So it, it may be a while before they make the playoffs, but, um, they're still going to be, um, you know, they, they're going to be a team down the road if they can hold on to all these guys that they've got. Yep. Um, but they, you know, you know, I mean, it's not the first time that they've, they've added a dead contract. You know, if you want to talk, but there, you know, a lot of speculation is Boland will never play again um, due to his injuries. But, you know, so they're essentially taking on a contract, allowing Florida to get rid of one. Maybe they're just freeing up space so they can make a trade. I don't know what what Florida's up to with that. But, um, you know, you know, sometimes uh, sometimes Wayne and I that there, there's another thing coming down the pike somehow. Yeah. Florida and Arizona and do something might be a year from now. Uh, and then I'm, and I might be just talking out the side of my neck, but you know, it, it's sometimes that happens where, you know, it's not all done at, at initially. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, time will tell to see what, what Florida's up to, but I really like that move for Arizona. Um, yeah, yeah I agree. For, for the future. So they really got, gave up just a couple of, and they didn't even have to give up a first round pick for, for Kraus and Kraus was a first rounder himself. So. Who knows? So um, very good. Don Braid uh, became the first woman to get a full time coaching gig in in the NHL when she signed a uh, contract with the Coyotes to become their full time skating coach. Um, you're seeing more and more of this around the league, where uh, they're signing. You know, it started with goaltending coaches, 
And now you're starting to see strength and conditioning coaches uh, that all the teams have. And now you're seeing them go with, uh, uh, you see more and more teams signing skating coaches. But uh, Dawn, become, Dawn Braid becomes the first woman to, uh, to sign a full-time coaching gig with an NHL team. Yeah, so a lot of women in hockey are definitely excited for this one. <laughs> yeah, the, I, you know, I was very glad to see it too. Did you watch the NHL Network's broadcast last night? Uh, NHL tonight. She was on the program live. Oh, was she? Yeah, no. and and they had some very interesting questions for her. But she sounds like she's very. My wife said my wife's into figure skating, so she knows that yep. Dawn is a figure figure skating background. Okay, but but they. Uh, they said that uh, you know she she answered some very good questions. Uh, it was, she was very interesting to listen to, um, and uh, a lot of what she said is 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 not good. With uh, a lot of the skaters in the NHL, is their balance when they skate up and down the ice and make turns. They they're they're not uh, balanced. I, I forget the exact words that she used, but it was she's she's knowledgeable about what she's going to be doing. Good. No, I think I think that's going to be good. And with the young kids they got there in Arizona, that will definitely help them. Uh, yeah, the the only um, and I and I've seen you know in my years growing up in playing hockey, you get exposed to a lot of these you know hockey schools and skating clinics and all this. And there was one name that came up over and over when I was growing up, Laura Stam. She's a a, a well known skating coach. Uh, I think she's up there in age nowadays, though. She probably wouldn't be interested in coaching uh, at the NHL level uh, because she's been around since I was a kid, and that was, you know, it's been eons and eons. I believe she still does have a uh, skating school or clinic or something um, that she has her name attached to, but uh, but that's another famous name that I've seen, and I know she's worked with NHL players one-on-one -on -one in the past, like in the summertime. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's good to see that, uh, you know, the NHL is giving, uh, giving women a shot at coaching. There you now, go. The next step is an assistant coach. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 you know, that, that stranger things have happened. Yeah. They put it to her last night. They said, who do you think is the best skater in the NHL? And she wouldn't commit and say anybody, you know, personally, but she said that Dylan Larkin was very good. That's, that's oh, how yeah. she said it. Yeah. Well, he... He won the speed uh, competition at the All Star Game, so yep. that's not a bad name to, <laughs> yep. to go for. Yeah. So, and earlier today, actually, uh, Hurricanes uh, extended GM Ron Francis's contract through the eighteen nineteen season. Uh, so, obviously, the Hurricanes owner feels that uh, Ron Francis is doing a good job with the Canes. It's not really yet showing on the ice, but uh, you're going to see it. Uh, probably this year, uh, you're going to start seeing that team uh, showing. They have, uh, I think ESPN, I saw an article earlier this week, ESPN rated the Carolina Hurricanes uh, in the top five for, uh, you know, rating the group of prospects that each team has. Oh, wow. And they, I, said, and they, said, and they said that the Hurricanes are in the top five in terms of, uh, you know, the prospects that they have coming up through. Uh, so that bodes well for the Hurricanes' future, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, also, earlier this week, Vegas, uh, that franchise keeps releasing all kinds of, uh, you know, they, they, they're trying to stay in front of everybody's eyes with, with their franchise. Let us know that they're still around. They keep, they keep hiring every new person that they hire. Um, you know, you've seen a headline of it. And I think they're up to like 15 people now working for the team. But anyway, earlier this week, uh, it came out that they have trademarked uh, three nicknames, uh, the Desert Knights, the Golden Knights, and the Silver Knights. And then earlier today, it came out that the Sand Knights have also been trademarked. Um, so it's beginning to look like that their team name is going to be one of those four. Yeah. If um, it's the Sand Knights, I'd be very disappointed. <laughs> you know? <laughs> That just doesn't uh, ring well with me. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, you know, they keep talking about all these, you know, they can't, they can't call themselves just the Knights, the Las, you know, because they kind of, their first instinct is they wanted to be the Las Vegas Knights. Um, but, uh, you know, they kept quoting uh, uh, trademark issues with that because the London Knights in the OHL 
uh, have that name. Right. But uh, if that's the case, then I don't see how they can use the Golden Knights either. Um, right. Because I know at least one college team here in the U.S. uses uh, the Golden Knights um, as their nickname. Uh, isn't is it Army? It's the Black Knights. Oh, that's right. They're Black Knights. Yeah, the Military Academy. Yeah. Golden Knights. I know Clarkson uses Clarkson University. Oh, do they really? In the okay, ECAC. Well, yeah, that. they're known as the Golden Knights. So, um, so you know, anyway. That saga is continuing. Um, they they still saying that they want to have their name in place before their preseason games that take place uh, in Vegas with the uh, with the LA Kings hosting a couple of teams here uh, later in September. So we should have them settle on a name. If that's the case, if they're going to make that goal, they should have a name here in the next uh, week or two. My my wife came up with the name the Desert Aces, and I thought that was a pretty cl- that's not bad. Name. That's yeah. actually a pretty good name, you know. It it gets the gambling thing in there, but uh, you can do a lot with the logo and the uniforms in terms of how they'll look. Uh, but you know, we're I not think, we're not uh, we're not uh, the guys making the name. No, <laughs> no, and I think that name has been mentioned, uh, but I think the NHL wants to avoid anything that has anything to do with gambling. Yeah. So, as yeah. as good as that one sounds. I think the NHL wouldn't be on board with that one just because of the gambling reference there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Cause that's, that's basically the whole reason that pro teams have avoided that city all these years is they don't want the gambling that goes on in Vegas to infiltrate their leagues. But you know, this day and age, if you're, you're going to have gambling one way or the other, right. You know, illegally or legally. That's right. Um, in all the leagues. It just doesn't happen just in Vegas anymore. But anyway, um, now this next story I put on the list because on last week's podcast, we talked about the contracts uh, that TV networks in the U.S. sign. Well, this past week, the Canadian uh, broadcast networks announced their contracts. I'm not going to go into big details with it, uh, only because uh, I live here in the U.S., I don't get the Canadian network, so I'm not familiar that much with what goes on in Canada, other than CBC has a hockey night in Canada every Saturday night. Uh, But TVA, who's the French sports network, and Sportsnet, who's the English sports network in Canada, both announced their schedules on the 24th of August. Um, Mm -hmm. I've included links uh, to uh, both articles in the show notes for this podcast, so if you do want to see the full uh, articles, you can go ahead and find those links and go ahead and click on those. Uh, But essentially, uh, in a nutshell, both networks are going to be televising. uh, I know one of them is doing, I think the the French is good doing 250 games uh, and the English network is going to be doing 300 games, which essentially is more than one a day. Mm -hmm. If you do the math, the season's about what, 180 days long? Right. Roughly. Um, yeah, six months. Yeah, roughly so, 100, roughly 180 days, and they're going to be broadcasting 250 and 300 games. So you're you're looking at essentially those sports network are going to be showing hockey games every night, if not one, two, three, um, you know, every single night. So kind of wish I had those networks with that many yeah. with that really? many games on them. But yeah, uh, but anyway, so if you want the full details, go ahead and click on the links in the show notes. Um, and we'll move on to the next one. Um, also, uh, was it yesterday? The NHL announced that the rookies, uh, 27, I think rookies gathered at the NHL PA rookie showcase in Toronto. Um, so all of these guys essentially are guys that are expected to make their teams, their respective teams, I guess, um, essentially was a way for the, um, I know Upper Deck was there. I don't know if any of the other trading card companies was there, but I I do know for a fact Upper Deck was there, um, and it was a it was an opportunity for all these players to skate uh, in their team's uniform, in their respective team's uniform, um, so that these card companies could get photos of them and essentially get you know a chance for them to get their. Uh, photos for their uh their upcoming trading cards that are going to be coming out 
And of yeah. course, they had meetings with the media and such as well. Um, so it was just a, a, a you know more of a, a showcase for the media more than anything. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's very uh, in terms of these guys. Uh, I guess they're all rookies. So uh, you know, uh, the card company is naturally gonna that that that's interesting because I didn't know that. Yeah, but uh, the card companies are gonna be flocking all over it. So and the o- the only one name that jumps out to me that has interest to you and I, I didn't see any Rangers on this list. Um, Jacob Zaborl of the Bruins. Who's not expected to make the Bruins uh, was on that list, but he'll probably play his season in. Uh, he just got out of juniors, so he'll be playing in Providence this year. Okay, because I don't see him making the Bruins unless they trade uh, one or two of their defensemen. He uh, is a defenseman. That's yeah, why. Yeah, he's a defenseman. Um, and unless they trade one or yeah, or they got to trade probably at least two of their defensemen for him to get any playing time. Because they have seven uh, defensemen under contract for this year on one-way deals, uh, and Saboral's not one of them. So, <laughs> I, so I don't see him breaking that lineup unless they get you know multiple injuries or uh, or they tr- make a trade or two of, of guys that they have now. Mm-hmm. Uh, next story: Alex Ovechkin got married over the weekend. Yeah, to model Nastya Shubskaya. Name's yeah. hard to say. Yeah. Um, so that hit the NHL uh, airwaves. Of course, you know, every chance to uh, show a picture of a, uh, you know, really good looking model because, uh, you know, obviously she is. She's a model. So, yeah. uh, you know, the NHL is going to take the opportunity to, to display that. But they showed a couple of pictures of them, uh, uh, you know, wearing their wedding rings and such. So. So for you ladies out there, Alex Ovechkin is no longer available. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the great eight it just went down. He's yeah. no longer got, he's no longer in play on that. Yeah, front. so we'll see if his play goes down as well. Yeah, you know, sometimes getting married and and if he starts having kids, that will that affects some of these guys, you know, performance negatively. But look what happened with Tiger Woods once he got married. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I think uh, uh, in the case of Alex Ovechkin, I think it's going to be a good thing for him. And I think he'll uh, – I, I just think he's on top of things now and is a good spokesman for the NHL and uh, finishes his check, so to speak. Yep. So another article that came across my desk uh, was the World Cup of Hockey. Um I don't know why it appeared on my news feed for this week, but the, the tickets went on sale on August 18th. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did a check today uh, just to see where they're at. The games aren't yet sold out, but boy, are the prices uh, high, particularly yeah. particularly when, when the games involve in Canada. Um, in fact, the link that I included in the show notes will link you to SeatGeek. Um, to a search for uh, World Cup tickets in general, and the and the ticket prices vary wildly depending on who's playing. Any game involving Canada, even the early round games, uh, start at one fifty and go up from there. Yeah. And that's and that's for nosebleeds. And that's U.S. dollars. U.S. That's dollars. U- U.S. dollars. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the lower bowl are three hundred and up on the games involving Canada. Now there the games yeah. involving uh USA aren't quite as bad. They're a hundred dollars uh for lower bowl and seventy dollars and up for upper bowl. And games that don't involve USA or Canada, so two European teams, you can get them as cheap as twelve bucks. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Isn't that something? I, I think the God. cheapest the cheapest game I saw was was a round robin game involving the two other teams in in USA and Canada's bracket, uh, Europe and Czechoslovakia. When they play each other, there are NHL games more expensive than those than than, than that game. So <laughs> yeah, so, so the, yeah, the ticket prices there are tickets still available for all games, but um, you know, you're you're going to get what you pay for, I guess, or 
I don't know if you, you you'd probably get a good game out of those those uh, cheaper games, but um, you know, obviously with the games being held in Canada, the ticket prices involving Canada are ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, 300, yeah. 300 bucks a ticket to see Canada play is is yeah. is insane, if you ask me. Outside of my uh, budget. <laughs> Cer- it's certainly outside of mine as well. Yeah. yeah. So, and you know, it'll be interesting to watch uh, to see how the prices fluctuate during the tournament. Right now, you can actually buy tickets to the uh, final um, <laughs> for actually less than the game's for a lower price than than the early round games for Canada now. So if you wanted to have a little investment there, you could buy some uh, final games now at a cheaper rate. And then if Canada makes it to the final, watch those tickets skyrocket. And you, can re- you can resell them for a really good price. Yeah. A little business yeah. opportunity for everybody out there. <laughs> yeah. For those um, of you that can hop the flight to Toronto too, you know. Yep. So, so that's pretty much it for NHL related uh, stuff that I have. Um, in the past couple of weeks since we've uh, last recorded, you know, it's been awfully boring in terms of hockey around here. So, um, I happened to notice that the KHL started their season. Uh, yes, I can't remember exactly when it's August twenty sixth. I think was the first yeah. game. Um, so I decided to give that league a look. It's the only hockey going right now. So I've been watching a little bit of the KHL. Um, it's kind of weird to watch games in Russian cause it's ha- kind of hard to find, uh, English, English speaking announcers for these, uh, for these KHL games. But, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's gotten my attention a little bit because obviously it's the only hockey we've got at the moment. Um, and there are some good players in that league. Um, you know, two that are come right off the top of my head are, are uh, of course, Pavel Datsuk and uh, Ilya, Ilya Kovalchuk. And, um, you know, there's a few other players that, that have played in the NHL that are playing over there. So, um, But I've, I've t- I took a look around that league, and there was two teams that stood out to me um, for no other reason than, than the jerseys that they wear. Okay? Yeah. First team that jumped out to me was... Uh, Severstal, uh, watched a little bit of their games. Uh, the reason they jumped out to me is they wear the black and gold that the Boston Bruins wear. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I watched a little bit of their games and when they score a goal in their arena, the horn that goes off is the whole goal, goal horn for the Boston Bruins. So I, I thought that was kind of interesting. So it's like, kind of like watching a Bruins game, you know? Yeah. And the That's other team pretty- that jumped out to me is the team based in Siberia. Uh, well, they, they're known as Sabir. Um, and that one jumped out to me and I kind of like them. They're a good, they're fun team to watch. Um, but the reason they jumped out to me is the jerseys that they wear remind me a lot of the university of Maine, um, which is obviously my favorite college team. So, um, they wear the light blue, dark blue, uh, and white combination jerseys that Maine wears. And I've watched a couple of games that they've had, and they've had a couple of home games here early in this in their season, and um, um, the crowds at that arena are very lively and very involved in the game. So I guess there's nothing else going on in Siberia this time of year, but um, <laughs> but they've got good crowds. The the arena's full, and the crowd is loud, and the games are fun to watch. So I don't know if there's anybody that jumped out for you. I know you've kind of been watching a little bit of it too. I, I got to give you, first of all, I got to give you, this was great. I, I didn't think of this idea at all with the KHL. And since you said something, I've been on the website looking at stuff, looking at arenas, familiarizing myself with the teams. I really didn't know much about the KHL. So Wayne, my hat's off to you. That's a great <laughs> idea you had. And uh, I, I checked out, you know, your teams there. Uh, I like that team with the anchor on their on their jersey, Admiral. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Vladivostok, Vladivostok. They 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 started in two thir- 2013, so they're not as uh, as as long standing of a team. But uh, their arena is like I don't know, 7,500 people maybe, and it's more. It's very modern, of course. They just built it, but it's out there on the on the ocean. It's near Beijing. Okay. And uh, so I guess it's in the in the east. 
uh, East one of the Eastern divisions. Yep. But uh, yeah, they 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 uh, it is really interesting if you go on that uh, website for the English uh, the English version of the KHL. It has each arena. It has the teams and their standings, who the coach is. It has a lot of good information about the teams. Yep. Uh, and uh, and you I, can I thought even, it was – You can even watch video highlights of past games. Um, yeah. And you can subscribe. They have a similar uh, similar subscription to what the NHL has. You can subscribe and watch live games. Uh, but the problem for us watching live games is Russia is – the Russian teams are anywhere from 6 to 12 hours ahead of us. Yeah, you know the teams in the Western Conference are are you know six, seven, eight hours ahead of us, and yeah. the, and the teams further east, uh, out towards the Pacific Ocean, are you know seven, eight, nine, or no, ten, eleven, twelve hours ahead of us. Yeah. Um. So the the Russian league is essentially playing their games while we're sleeping. So, so it's right. kind of hard to catch their games live. But I have been watching a lot of highlights and and watching games on replay. Uh on their website. But, uh, yeah, we, the, the website he's talking about is en.khl.ru. That's the KHL main website for the English language. And I've also included another link, uh, to a website that has, uh, games, uh, live feeds. If you can get their live feeds and, and it works for, uh, in a time that works for you. Um, the link to that, is uh it's it's kind of a lot of weird characters it doesn't really it's not very good to read uh you have to go onto the show notes of, for this podcast to see um to see that link but uh we've included that link as well uh but essentially the KHL if you're not familiar with it it's 29 teams uh based mostly in Russia uh but yeah. but uh there is a team couple of teams uh I know there's a team in in based in Czechoslovakia um, yep. There's teams in Finland. Uh, there's actually a team in China this year. They just started a team. Yeah. There's a team in Beijing, uh, China. And um, as of yet, they haven't played their first game, but they will be playing. Uh, their Kunlun Red Star is the name of that team. And they're based in Beijing. And they're playing in the arena that was used for uh, basketball in the Olympics, the Beijing Olympics. Mm -hmm. So it's a big arena. Uh, in fact, I believe it's the biggest one in the KHL. Yeah, at this from what point. I've seen, it is. Yeah, in, in terms of uh, in terms of how many fans they can hold. Um, so, so the KHL is expanding into China, and there's actually several players that are going to be playing on that team that are Chinese. So, it'll be interesting to see how that that team does, um, yeah. as China is not known as as producing a lot of world class hockey players. <laughs> That's right. Not at all, as a matter of fact. Yeah. But I I, uh, I took a look at uh, at uh, some of the uh, arenas. You know, I found it spectacular. Some of the architecture for some of the arenas that they show. Some of them are very old. They're the old arenas. The the team's probably been around for a long time. There's no From doubt. From the about old it. Soviet bloc, yeah. Right, but I mean, for example, Sochi. That arena is beautiful, and I mean, they they that team is playing what is thirteen thousand people at seats. I think that one was the arena that was built for the Olympics. That, yes, that it were is. taken in, in, in Sochi. So, yeah, I think that team actually came out of the Olympics. I don't think there was a team in Sochi before um, before the Olympics. And then the KHL added the Sochi team after. I think you're right. Yeah. St. Petersburg has a beautiful, I mean, a beautiful arena. Um, I, I looked at that one today. That's a big arena. 13,000 people, I think. Uh, yeah. And the St. Petersburg SKA team is where uh, Datsuk is playing. Okay, and Kovalchuk's playing there too. They got those two guys on the same line. You ought to watch that that team play. It's weird to yeah. see. It's weird to see Datsuk in a blue uniform because that's a blue. Blue is the primary color. Red is the uh, the trim on, oh, that, oh, okay. on that team. And uh, you know it's 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 weird to see Datsuk in blue. You know, knowing all these years you're playing for the Red Wings. <laughs> yes, it's, it's it's really neat. Great idea. But yeah, the the uh, the league, obviously the 29 teams, you know, they're based in different cities throughout Russia. The arenas vary wildly in size. You know, the NHL um, is rather boring in terms of the arenas. All the arenas are between 16 and 22,000 people. 
They're all built the same way. They're all built essentially to pack as many people as they can to keep them as close to the game as possible for that many people. But like you said, the Russian ranks, a lot of them are very unique. Um, I remember seeing one that has essentially, you know, all the seats are on one side of the arena mm -hmm. and there's virtually no seats on the other side of the arena. Just a, seems like a wall with a few, few seats like attached to the wall going straight up. Yeah. <clears throat> and you know, they they vary in size. Some of the arenas are as few as 3000 seats and you know, they go on up to, you know, 15, 16,000. Uh, and then you've got that one in China that's got over 18,000. Right. Um, so, so, but it's a league that's also taken a lot of heat in the past for having money issues. Um, so you hear stories of players not getting paid in a timely fashion. Um, so, but I can understand that. I mean, they're, they're going after, they're trying to lure some of the, in particularly the Russian players to come back and play there and, and given the bigger stars, big money. But if you, if you do the math and you do the, you know, work out the, the, the money part of it, you're dealing with small arenas, you know, probably on average of seven to 8,000 seats on average. Mm -hmm. And you're dealing with, um, a populace that makes far less money on average than the typical American or Canadian. I think I saw somewhere where the average Russian citizen brings home less than a thousand dollars a month. Yeah. Um, so there's not a lot of money in that country um, amongst the regular people, you know, you know, there's obviously going to be plenty of people that got more money than that, but, but, the average citizen is what I'm talking about, you know, are making far less than what the average citizen here in the States and in Canada makes. Uh, so they don't have as much money to spend to go to the games. Um, you're dealing with smaller arenas so that there's no way they can compete with the NHL in contract money. Right. So the players that they're going after essentially are guys that um, are not quite good enough to be regulars in the NHL. Um, but are good enough to be, you know, that next tier below that, mm -hmm. because if they, their choices are either play in the KHL or stay here and play in the American hockey league and the American hockey league salaries are, I don't believe there's anybody making more than 200,000. I and in fact, I think it's even less than that American hockey league. I'm not sure what the top American hockey league salary is, but I know it's not anywhere near what NHL guys make. Yeah. Um, so they can, you know, if, if their top, let's say it's a hundred thousand, if their top salary, if they could play in the American league and, and make at most a hundred thousand over here, well, you know, if they get offered a $300,000 contract to go play in the KHL, that looks a lot better. Plus they're home. Sure. So, sure. so the, so, and and it's becoming known around the world that the KHL is becoming the second best hockey league in the world, second yeah. obviously to the NHL, um, but it it is known to be or it's debated to be the is better than the AHL in terms of talent. Mm -hmm. So so it's not a bad league, right? And the games are fun to watch. So um, so. We're watching that anyway while we're waiting for uh, our guys to get going over here. We'll yeah. pro we probably will stop paying attention to the KHL <laughs> once the NHL gets going. Um, but it'll be worth a look every now and then to see what's going on over there. Because I know their, their season starts way earlier than ours, uh, mostly because uh, the Russians want all their players available to play for um, the, the world championship team. Um, they care about the world championships a lot more than we do yeah. um, because the world championships go on during our playoffs. So, um, so obviously our best players aren't going to go and play in the world championship uh, if they're still playing over here. Right. So the, yeah, their season starts and ends uh, sooner than we do. So anyway, um, so with the KHL, there's a couple of, uh, um, well, we already talked about one of the stories that I came is 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 that there's a team in China now, which I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, but the other story that came out of the KHL in the past couple of weeks 
uh, was uh, Russian defenseman Demir Respaev uh, earned a lifetime ban uh, from the KHL. Yeah. Which which uh, made a lot of people over here go, whoa, a lifetime ban. What did he do? Yeah. Well, we included... I included a couple of links in the show notes. If you haven't seen it already, uh, you should go take a look at this. Um, basically, in a nutshell, what this guy did to earn the lifetime ban, well, partially what he did was uh, against this new uh, China team, and it was in China. So the KHL is trying to showcase this league to the citizens of China, and then you get a game there, and this guy just goes off the deep end, and he fought, I think I counted six players yeah all, all at once fought the whole team yeah. yeah i mean he just went from one i mean he went from <laughs> one player to another to another yeah. just you know going after everybody who was on the ice and then he went over to the bench and went after one guy on the bench yeah. uh it's quite something i mean it, it i mean the guy was just he just went off the deep end and was a complete lunatic um yeah. he's only 21 years old obviously trying to make a name for himself um but I also looked into this and, you know, how would this one incident earn a lifetime ban? Well, uh, as it turns out, I guess this guy has a reputation (laughs) for being this kind of player and only this kind of player. Yeah. I was going to say, even though it is bad what he did and he hit, he went and started, tried to start fights with players on the bench and everything. He knocked the one guy out. They took him off on a stretcher. Uh, but you know, still to give him a lifetime ban for that. So I was interested to hear what you, you found out as, as to why he's gone for good. Well, well, you know, you know, John Scott, right over here. Yeah. You know, his reputation just being a guy uh, other than the all-star game stuff that happened last year. Um, you know, as, as we all learn, he's kind of nice guy off the ice, you know? Yeah. But on the ice before the all-star game, he had a reputation of just being nothing but a pair of fists on skates. Yeah. That's essentially all he was in, in the NHL. And that's all he was good for. And he bounced from team to team, just being, um, their enforcer. Well, that's essentially what this guy is. Yeah. He is, he is essentially the John Scott of the KHL. <laughs> you know, if you want to put it in, 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 in a nutshell. Um, and there's a, there's a, the other video that I posted basically shows, um, just a, uh, it's a clip, but it's made up of many clips of him just beating up guys. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so essentially sounds like he's been a problem in that league for quite some time. And then when he went off on the deep end on, in this case, uh, in a game, it was just a preseason game. It wasn't even a regular season game. So, you know, they weren't really playing for anything. And it was a game, it was, I believe, it was either the first or second game that was played at this uh, Beijing arena. Yeah. So, they're, you know, it's, it's a showcase game. They're trying to sell the game to the citizens of China. They go to the game or watch it on TV and see this guy going around from player to player just beat, <laughs> beating everybody up. Yeah. The KHL finally said, enough is enough. You're out of here. We don't <laughs> want you in anymore. You know, go... <laughs> Go find something else to do or go play in another league. Let so. me tell you what he could too. He could come over here to the United States <laughs> and get in the AHL or the ECHL and have a, have a go and I would probably do well. I wouldn't be surprised if some ECHL team. Yeah. I don't think, I don't think an American hockey league team will pick him up, but it wouldn't surprise me one bit if an ECHL team, Picks this guy up because, you know, those guys are just trying to put butts in the seats and um, it wouldn't be a bad way to do it, you know, yeah. to just have a guy on their team just to, you know, go nuts. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see if any, and of course, if he does sign, even if it is an ECHL or or one of these Southern Professional Hockey League or one of these smaller pro leagues that exist around the, around the area, um, if he does land over here, uh, we're gonna hear about it. So oh yeah, we'll definitely yeah. hear about it. So it'll That's be something. True. It'll be something worth, um, worth talking about. So you sh- you should remember that name, Dmitry <laughs> Resparov. Res- uh, Respaev, yeah, Respaev. Yeah. Uh, don't forget that name because Demir I agree. Dmitry Respaev, yeah. 
Yeah. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see if he does end up landing over here. So, well, good. Um, I don't know about you, but that's all I have. That's what we have for this week, right? That's what we have. Yeah. Um, you know, coming up in the, in the next, we we actually are going to start going weekly. Uh, this will be, well, this will be the first uh, episode that that is part of our weekly uh, episodes because next week. Uh, we're going to get together and we're going to start breaking down uh, in the next four weeks. We're going to take in each week, we're going to take one division in the NHL and take a closer look because we kind of skimmed over um, pretty much all the teams in the in the past few episodes that we've done. We just skimmed over the highlights and the headlines. Um, but in the next four weeks, we're going to we're going to take a look. We're going to start with the Metro division. And we're going to take a look at every team in that division and kind of do a preview of what to expect for each of those four te- or each team in those four divisions. Um, but next week we'll do the Metro division. The following week we'll do the Atlantic. And then we'll um, go out west to the Pacific. And then we'll finish up with the Central division um, four weeks from now. And uh, that should put us right into, and of course, in the meantime, all the hockey that does take place during these four weeks, um, we're going to talk about as well. But um, we are going to take a closer look at um, all 30 teams within the next four weeks anyway. So I'm really looking forward to get getting into the nitty gritty of the season now because, uh, like I said, six days from now, the guys get back on the ice or the world cup guys get back on the ice right. and, uh, and the NHL guys get back on the ice shortly after that. So we're getting there. <laughs> Preseason starts on the 25th, right? 25th. Uh, so uh, yes, the 25th. So we don't have long to go, Wayne, by the time we finish this fourth episode, we'll be in the well into the preseason. Yeah. And training camps start, I think the 17th, I think is a date that yeah. I saw. Uh, where all the NHL teams get together. But, again, you have the, the, the rookies go in a couple of weeks early uh, because, you know, pretty much all 30 teams are, are involved in some sort of um, activity where they're, you know, the rookies of each NHL team will be playing rookies from other NHL teams. Um, so, and that's just, geez, 10, 11 days from now. So, um so yeah, we're getting going here. We're hitting the end of the summer and everything is ramping up at this point. Yeah. Exciting so, time. So I'm starting to get the fever. Can't wait. <laughs> I've had the fever for a while. I mean, <laughs> come on. We're, 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 we're watching KHL games for crying out loud. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you, you know, you're getting it bad when you start yeah. watching Russian, Russian yeah. hockey. So. And you go on their website, and, hey, this is pretty neat. Yeah, let me check out these arenas. Mm -hmm. And uh, What's your favorite shirt, you know? What's your favorite jersey? Exactly. Yeah, Yeah. so, so yeah. Um, So it's all coming to an end. And I I believe next week, too, all the junior leagues in Canada get going on their preseason. Actually, I think they've already started. I saw saw a couple of tweets earlier today from um, a couple of the – uh, Quebec major junior hockey league teams uh, having preseason games already. So, so yeah, we're getting going here. So, yeah. um, so we're looking forward to it. So we're going to go ahead and start our team preview process uh, here with the next episode. So with that, um, unless you have anything else, I think we'll call it, call it. A, I think that good. sounds a good stopping point to me, Wayne. Okay. Uh, good working with you. Sounds good. All right. So until next week, we'll uh, catch you later. Well, there you have it. Steve and I are very excited for the upcoming season, and as we mentioned, we're moving to weekly episodes as preseason activities are finally getting going. Over the next four weeks, we'll take a look at all 30 teams in the NHL, along with discussing the headlines of the week. Next week, we'll be previewing the Metropolitan Division teams. The week after, we'll preview the Atlantic Division, and then we'll preview the Pacific and Central Divisions during the following two episodes. If you like the show, please show us your support by subscribing to it using your favorite podcatcher program or app. You can also share it with your friends. The Hockey Nuts podcast can be found on major podcast search engines like iTunes and Google Play Music. 
just search for the term The Hockey Nuts in those apps. There are a few ways you can get involved with the show. You can email the show at feedback at thehockeynuts.com or you can leave us a voicemail in our voicemail box at 919-960-1718. Again, the number 919-960-1718. We'll address your feedback on future episodes of the Hockey Nuts podcast. You can also tweet me. I'm at WayneHalley9. And Steve finally set up his Twitter account, and he's at sball504man. Also, be sure to visit our website at thehockeynuts.com. The site is as new as the show, but we have a blog going already, and we've been hard at work writing Midsummer Update articles on all 30 NHL teams. In the future, we'll be offering not only a blog, but all kinds of resources on that website, not just for hockey fans, but for those of you who want to be involved in the game in your area as a player, coach, official, or even the Zamboni guy. As always, links that we mention in the show are available in the show notes for this episode. Finally, we're also looking for future guests for the show. Obviously, we're not experts on every team in every league in hockey. So if you consider yourself more knowledgeable than us on a particular team or league, we certainly want to hear from you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Hockey Nuts Podcast, and until next week, we'll catch you at the ring. Oh, 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 oh,